Give a very warm welcome to you all in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and a warm welcome to all with us online. Our meetings this week are as normal, God willing, on Wednesday at 7.30 for prayer and Bible study. Next Lord's Day at 10.30 in the morning and 6 p.m. in the evening. And God willing, I will be the preacher. And uh, just to say, we, we have been singing, uh, but it's just been our, our practice uh, to wear the mask and to sing just at a conversational level, just not too heartily. That's all we would happily, obviously, sing heartily uh, if it were uh, at a different, normal time. Uh, but it's precious, I think, to be able to sing to the Lord and to give him our thanks and praise. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do praise and thank you, Lord, that we may come before you to call upon your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is a perfect saviour, your eternal son, who has become a man, humbled himself to take upon himself our frail flesh and to suffer and to die in our place and to rise again the third day victorious. Lord, we do praise you for these things. We thank you, Lord, that there is a full and free salvation in him, forgiveness for all our sins, and Lord, mercy and grace that endures forever. Have mercy upon us this night. Pardon, Lord, all our many sins and receive us in our Saviour's name. Bless us, we pray. Meet with us each one according to our own spiritual need. Help us and watch over us in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn is number 277, 277, in Christian hymns, Lamb of God, Thou Now Art Seated.
Our readings are firstly from Jeremiah chapter 36 and then from 2 Peter 3. Jeremiah 36. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against this people. And Baruch the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah in the ninth month that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. Then read Baruch in that book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah the son of Shaphan the scribe, in the higher court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. And then from the second letter of Peter, and chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and for ever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless to our hearts the reading from his precious word. Now let us look again to the Lord in prayer. Let's all pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we may uh, bring our praise, our thanks to you, and also our burdens and uh, requests. We thank you, Lord, that you would have us pour out our hearts before you. We thank you, Lord, that you know all things and you know the things that we need even before we ask. And you are able to, to answer in far greater ways than we can ever uh, imagine. We thank you, Lord, for your glorious purposes of grace to a lost race. We thank you for a glorious Saviour who has come to do that which we could never do, to bear our sorrows and to deliver us from eternal wrath and to give us eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for the record of his work, of all that he came uh, to do uh, and to teach. Uh, we thank you for uh, it given to us in your word. We thank you for all of that, the precious truth that is given to us in the Bible, all the record of your people of old and of your dealings with them, looking forward to the coming of our Saviour and to the words of the apostles given to us to explain all these things for our understanding, for our receiving. We thank you, Lord, that we have it now preserved for us and uh, in our own tongue. We do pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, in those places and with those peoples that as yet have not it in their own tongue, that those who labor to such an end would be guided and granted help and wisdom. Uh, and Lord, that all peoples might have access to your word. We thank you, Lord, that above all things, it points us to the Savior, uh, to, to put our trust in him, to shows us our need and points us to him as the only Savior of sinners. We pray, Lord, that uh, in our land that you would have mercy and yet turn many back to him. Lord, we are sad that so few uh, esteem your word and the record we have there and the testimony uh, of all that he came to do. And we pray, Lord, that people would be pricked in their hearts and consider at this time the, the vanity of this world and the inability of men uh, to, to cope with the things that come along, the things that come from your hand, and to seek uh, a sure and certain forgiveness and pardon in and through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us, we pray. Bless your people up and down this land as we seek to stand and to hold fast to your word and to make our Saviour known. Bear pardon, Lord, our many shortcomings, our many failings. And Lord, please bless your word.
bless it to young and to old, uh, to all that we pray that many would yet hear and turn and seek the Saviour for themselves. Bless in this city where you have set us. Uh, we pray that you would uh, awaken and open the eyes of many, many so uh, comfortable in their unbelief, so uh, content with the things of this world, with no real thought for their immortal souls. But we pray, Lord, that you would shake them and have mercy upon them. We pray particularly for the young growing up in, in the midst of much confusion with those that would teach them our very wrong things. We pray that you would have mercy upon them and deliver them uh, from such teaching and bring them to hear your word and to turn to the Saviour. Lord, bless, we pray. Help us here that we, you might bless our testimony Grant us, Lord, to hold fast to your word. Deliver us, Lord, from turning aside and keep us in your care. Watch over us, Lord, uh, in the coming week. Bless, Lord, our testimony as you give us opportunity, in particular that we might have opportunity to speak uh, to loved ones that know you not. And Lord, help us all. Uh, bless, we pray, any that are uh, sick and are unable to be with us, we pray that you would draw near to them. Lord, help us and watch over us. Guide our steps. Help us, Lord, to call upon you. Help us, Lord, to seek you day by day. And help us, Lord, to ever to trust in your grace and in your mercy. Watch over us all. And Lord, help us now. We do thank you for your precious word. We pray you would open it. Uh, to our hearts and minds uh, and grant right, right understanding and light and help. Lord, bless us, we pray in all things in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Our second hymn is number 331, based on Psalm 19, The Heavens Declare Thy Glory, Lord.
please turn with me to Psalm 119 and verse 129. Now I preached on this, these, this portion last Lord's Day morning. And uh, Psalm, uh, verse 129, thy testimonies are wonderful, or a wonder, therefore doth my soul keep them. And I mentioned that there are wonders really in the fact that we have the word of God now with us, the fact of inspiration, uh, the fact that we have it complete, and that we have it preserved, but that I did not have time then to go through those things. Uh, but I hope in a little way and in other aspects more fully to consider how the word of God is wonderful. The word wonderful is literally that. It is the word that is translated the same in Isaiah 9 verse 6, speaking of the Lord, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And truly, uh, the greatest wonder of the scriptures is the subject matter that they speak of the Savior who will come. The Lord Jesus Christ will come as a man, spoken of from Genesis 3:15 uh, to the end, as the only Savior, the one, a wonder in his person, both God and man, and that God gives free and full forgiveness and pardon in him, and that he would come and suffer and die in the place of sinners. That wonderful, glorious message that we find nowhere else in the world, unless it be taken from the scriptures themselves. But it's very sad that people in our day by and large despise the word of God, think of it as unworthy of their reading, of their pondering, so different to maybe 150 years ago. Um, and one can read of accounts of a Victorian home that so many would have portions of the scripture maybe uh, on the wall or, or Bibles at hand and often read. I heard a presenter, I think it was this week or last week, on one of the national radio stations, one of the BBC's stations, talking about the wisdom of Percy Sugden. Now, Percy Sugden, you may not know, was a long-running character in Coronation Street, and uh, the, the, the presenter was appealing to people to communicate text or email or whatever, how if they had uh, learnt, had uh, guidance in life from Coronation Street. And, uh, and this uh, presenter obviously had watched it for years and years and years. And really how sad it is that people take guidance from such a thing that they take not guidance from the word of the Lord, but from a sure and certain true wisdom uh, that would, if they would take heed, would give them eternal salvation, let alone help for this life. Uh, and this verse commends the word of God to us. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. But I'd like to begin firstly with how do we know that we have the word of God? It is, in one sense, a wonder that God speaks to man. Uh, we, as rebellious sinners, it is a wonderful evidence of his love and of his mercy that he continues uh, to speak to man, that though we fell, though Adam fell, yet God met with him. God gave him the promise of the Savior that would come, and from that day on, God has not ceased to speak to man, uh, that we believe from the uh, history we have in the scriptures that there have always been prophets in one sense. Now, since the coming of our Savior, we have a complete word, uh, and now simply we teach uh, and speak from this word. 
but before then those who were directly inspired by the Lord and some of whom, some of whose words were recorded for us. Uh, and a wonderful thing that God did not leave us to ourselves, but continued to deal with us and speak to us, that the infinite God would speak to us uh, uh, about our own selves and point us the way to him. Uh, and wonderful that it has been recorded in the scriptures and now we have it today uh, and we have it, uh, we had the Old Testament completed by the time of our Savior's coming or some 400 years before and now we have a complete Bible from roughly 100 AD. Uh, but how did people know? How did the people of old know that what they were given was the word of God? How did the church of old uh, receive the word of God to put it into the New Testament canon? Well, it may seem obvious, uh, it may seem overly simplistic, but simply that the writers uh, or the prophets themselves said it was God's word. And one may say, well, that opens the way for all manner of deceit. And certainly there were many deceivers, but God gave signs and a means to test those who were uh, declaring what they preached, what they taught to be the word of God, gave the people signs to, to, to test them by. If it was in one sense, wholly new revelation, a whole new period of revelation, they would be given wonderful signs as Moses was, uh, 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 amazing miracles to demonstrate that he was God's particular messenger for that time. Elijah and Elisha at the, not that there weren't prophets before, at the beginning, uh, before Isaiah and Jeremiah and others would minister and write, so wonderful signs and would establish the schools of the prophets but the prophets would also each one would have to show that they are truly inspired by the prophecies that they gave and they may have given other prophecies not recorded in speaking to individuals as we read of samuel and saul but to show that they were true uh, and so the, the people of God of old would receive their writings as true. Um, it is remarkable that uh, they were written down uh, and in a measure that they now have survived. Many of the prophets possibly losing their lives, many of them at their time of, of writing despised, but still the word of God uh, abides and remains. The New Testament writers, one might say, in the same way, did they write and did the church, uh, a central committee of the church, sit down and go through the writings and say, this one is inspired, that one's not? No, we find no such, uh, such goings on in the early church. But in the same principle, the writers of the New Testament uh, were, they claimed authority and they were those who had been appointed by God with that authority as apostles or their immediate uh, helpers. Uh, and uh, they speak with the authority. They may not say, thus saith the Lord, as the prophets of old might speak, but they speak with a similar authority. John says this in 1 John 4, verse 6, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He could say authoritatively that those that receive the apostles' writings are those uh, who have the spirit of truth. We are the way to be judged, the apostles. Uh, 
uh, the way to be judged. Uh, in Second Peter, Peter speaks uh, of the apostles in the same way as he does of the prophets, that they are, uh, that their writings in one sense is on an equal footing. Second Peter chapter 1 and uh, 19 to 21, he speaks of uh, the, the, uh, the, the prophets. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the script prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then he, he sets forth his, his a, a, a wonderful estimation of the prophets. And then in chapter 3, verse 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. The apostles spoken of in the same breath uh, as of the prophets of equal uh, weight. And also he speaks of Paul. Uh, verse 15. Uh, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction, that they rest Paul's letters, which are scriptures, as they do the other scriptures, and according to Paul, the honor as an apostle of one writing scripture. Uh, and all uh, the, the, the letters and the gospels, in one sense, written, one might say, by the apostles. Certainly, we have uh, Mark and we have Luke, writing Luke, the gospel of Luke and Acts, but Mark is almost universally held to have been Peter's secretary, amanuensis, and who traveled with Peter and writing down Mark under the instruction and guidance of Peter. And, uh, and Luke similarly worked very closely, spent many years traveling with Paul uh, and attested to by Paul. Uh, and the, the New Testament scriptures given to individual churches by and large so that they could receive them as the word of God from Paul or whoever and they could attest that they are genuinely from Paul. I, I must confess hadn't really thought of this much before uh, doing some preparation for this but you read the epistles uh, and they are full of little personal details. Romans chapter 16, full of greetings and personal details relating to Paul's relationship with different believers there. Uh, and that though Paul had never been to Rome uh, until that point, yet this would show that it was genuinely from him, that it was his letter by his own hand, whether he actually wrote it down or another wrote it down, but his own letter to them, and therefore they may receive it as genuine, as apostolic, and as scripture, as, as they did. And one must say of Romans, wonderfully authoritative. Here, Paul is setting forth the gospel, very clear terms. He doesn't say, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. Very clear, wonderfully argued but setting forth the truth of the gospel. And uh, 
Uh, he speaks likewise in Galatians with the authority of an apostle, speaking of his gospel as being given by revelation from the Lord Jesus himself, but very strong words when he says in verse 8 of chapter 1, uh, or, or verse 8 and 9, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. One could not speak really more, more strongly, setting forth this is the truth, this is what is revealed from God, we must hold fast to it and believe it. Uh, and different individual churches could would receive the letter. They were encouraged, we believe, to share them. As he says in Colossians, they're encouraged to read, send their letter and to read another's uh, and to gather them as the scriptures. Even John in Revelation, he is told by the Lord to write the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, where he uh, is generally thought to have ministered before being taken away, exiled to Patmos. And they would receive us from one they knew, one they knew to be an apostle, to be inspired. And in that way, so the New Testament was uh, received and built up and never did the church sit down uh, and and uh, as a united body decide on what was inspired what was not certainly oh in the years following uh, there is ample record those that know will say the early church fathers that they testified which ones were received as uh, revelation, Athanasius, uh, Eusebius, godly men would record what they believed had been given, and that is evidence of what the church had received. Now, I'm no expert on these things, but uh, this is what others would say. And we have a historical evidence. Above and beyond that, there is the evidence of the scriptures themselves. They are given to mankind. They are given in one sense to every individual who can read or can hear to receive or to reject uh, as the word of God to us. And they have a wonderful internal evidence in and of themselves uh, that they are the word of God. Uh, we read. One man I've heard say he gives a challenge to seekers to read the New Testament twice in an unprejudiced way uh, without becoming a Christian. It, it, you cannot really. Uh, and, and if we read it in a simple, unprejudiced way, not naive, but uh, it will, the Lord will show us. Uh, and it is very hard to say this is vain or fraudulent. Uh, or just a, a myth, uh, but the word of God stands by itself and with its own uh, authority. And wonderful, in that sense, thy testimonies are wonderful, wonderful message given to man, uh, inspired by the Lord and overruled and given to us for us to receive. And obviously over the centuries, uh, uh, the church records its uh, heritage that is received from others. We look back to the Westminster Confession, the Baptist Confession, the first portions of which will say, these are the books we believe to be inspired, and they likewise from, from further back and so on, but received originally from the apostles given to the church by the Lord, to take and receive as his word. Uh, and we have uh, what we might call the provenance made plain, the 
chain of custody, the Americans seem to call it, that sadly seems to be missing in much uh, of their election, uh, but a chain of evidence that we can see received by the Romans, received by the Corinthians, passed on, and so on, uh, that we have it uh, and have a wonderful warrant to receive it as the word of God. Now I know, and I must confess, I have never studied these things because I think they are unhelpful. I know in the last, I don't know, since 1850s, uh, there is enormous amounts of scholarship, unbelieving scholarship really, to rubbish these things, to say Moses never wrote the Pentateuch. I remember speaking to a young man who was at London Bible College, asking him what was his assignment that he had to do at the moment. And he said uh, to, to work out whether Paul was the writer of Corinthians. And I think what a waste of time. And you have to look up all these unbelieving scholars who have used their utmost to rubbish these things. But there's plenty of evidence in the scriptures and from uh, history, as it were, to persuade us that it is worthy of our reception as the word of God. But I must go on because there is more. Uh, thy testimonies are wonderful. There is, one must say, a wonderful, really providentially, really miraculous preservation of the scriptures. Uh, the object of scorn, the object of unbelieving scholarship, the object uh, of violence, the scriptures have been over the centuries, yet it has been preserved entire and complete. People think, oh, well, I don't need to believe the Bible because it's like Chinese whispers. Uh, they think that it's just all been corrupted over time and it's now been written down, but it's all really of no worth for them reading. But again, if you, with a little consideration, one finds, no, that is not so. The Old Testament, one might have the greatest concern about, and men did score, pour scorn uh, and say, how do we know that it hasn't been corrupted? But in the uh, 20th century first part and, and later on, wonderful things to show that it has not been so. We, we have it. We have the Lord's testimony, the Lord Jesus's testimony, that what he had was an authentic copy of the Old Testament scriptures. He never said anything otherwise. And we have wonderful evidence that the copies we have now are what the Lord Jesus had and the disciples had. Uh, there is a man, an American uh, scholar, who gave his life's work, a believing scholar, Robert Dick Wilson, if you want to look it up further, wonderful testimony, how he set his life to study and show that literally uh, every word of the Old Testament was trustworthy to undermine all the liberal scholarship. Uh, and he learned all the languages that he needed, that the Old Testament had been translated into Ethiopic, Syriac, many different languages. He said, well, some people uh, read novels. I read dictionaries, ancient language dictionaries. And he studied the word of God. He was a, a lecturer at Princeton and uh, studied the Old Testament texts and then published his findings and totally undermined the liberal scholarship that said we had we couldn't be sure that what we had was true. And then also the Dead Sea Scrolls and in other ways, other things that uh, totally uh, back up what we have. He himself said some of the parts of the scriptures, the Old Testament that seems of less interest uh, can be very important in such matters. He takes the genealogies and the names uh, and we can go to the British Museum and other places and compare the names. It may seem a simple thing to us of Sennacherib 
of Jehu that we find on monuments there. And they are precisely, he says out of some, I can't remember the exact figures, out of 24 names that we find elsewhere in archeology, span only some five letters in the total of letters of their names are different to what we find in the scriptures to show that firstly, that they were accurate contemporary records, but also that they have been preserved and kept and not corrupted. Uh, one portion that is not often we might read it and think, why is this here? Where Abraham uh, buys a field from Ephron the Hittite, we have details of the transaction, the words that are spoken and uh, Robert Dick Wilson says, from archaeological records, we find that this is precisely how the Hittites did their conveyancing. Now, conveyancing, we might think, is the dullest of things, but in this example, it shows that what was recorded was true, because the Hittite Empire uh, was destroyed a little while, some while after that, a long time before when the liberal scholars said that these things were written and could not have been so. But all these little things show us that not only was it contemporaneous, but also truly preserved. But uh, in the New Testament, we have so many texts. It is very hard to, to, to argue some four or 5,000 texts in the, the thousand years up to 1,000 AD, the great majority are backing the, the received texts that we have in uh, the old authorized version, the Greek text underlying it, uh, but wonderfully preserved, wonderfully kept. And so that we may trust that we have an accurate word of God. Many other things I won't, I'll just list a few. Thy testimonies are wonderful, amazing, internal consistency, both in doctrine and fact. They teach the same things from beginning to end that salvation is by grace through faith. Uh, and the more you read, the more you see these things. Amazing consistency in little details. Uh, in the genealogies, in the timings, all these things. Uh, there is a book written called Scriptural Coincidences that lists some of these things that may appear coincidental and yet confirm the internal consistency of the Word of God. Uh, wonderful, uh, harmonious, that written by some 40 authors over 1500 years, yet and so from many different backgrounds, yet all agree, all endorse each other's doctrine. Uh, uh, and in that sense, uh, a wonder and wonderful. Uh, the prophecies, again, one cannot go into details, but somebody, uh, Isaac Newton, whether he was a true believer, is sometimes hard to say, but he wrote a, a helpful book on seeking to show how the prophecies of the Bible have been fulfilled. A great scientist, not one given to flights of fancy, but he records in great detail how particular prophecies in the scriptures, in the life of our Savior and in history have been precisely fulfilled. And uh, matters such as Daniel and how he predicted the course of ancient history over some 500 years with wonderful precision uh, and accuracy. Thy testimonies are wonderful. Uh, and I'll just close with this, the wonderful effects of the Bible are in the lives of those that believe it, that believe the scriptures concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, that he has suffered and died for sinners, and that there is forgiveness in him, so able to make wise unto salvation that is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures are 
and the wonderful effects in, in every individual life of new birth, of pardon, of, of a complete turning around uh, of the life of one lost in sin and in darkness to trusting uh, in the Savior uh, and in being given everlasting life. You may know a number of us have read it of a book called The Book That Made Your World, written by an Indian man who uh, sets forth, it's, it's a very helpful book, sets forth uh, and helpful to be written by an Indian man, how the Bible shaped the best aspects of Western society, how we trace democracy and liberty, freedom of conscience, how the rule of law, uh, how right governance in that sense, science, uh, how the, the great pioneers of modern science were by and large biblical believers and sought to follow the scriptures like Isaac Newton. But uh, all these things given to us uh, by their love for the word of God, the compassion that we see uh, in, put into law in this land and others by folk through the workings of people like Wilberforce or uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury because they were Bible-believing Christians. And it's very sad to hear atheists despise the word of God and yet they, uh, they esteem the things that the scriptures have brought to pass really in society through the wisdom given in them, uh, that those are the things that they themselves esteem. But uh, wonderful effects in individual lives, in society uh, as a whole. And uh, a living word. I know I spoke on it last week, but verse 130 in Psalm 119, the entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding, unto the simple, it gives light to the soul. It is not uh, a mere academic intellectual word, but applied by the spirit of God to the heart, gives life and understanding. And uh, I was hearing two men, both uh, ex-Roman Catholics, the one uh, uh, who had been a priest, a man called Richard Bennett, now with the Lord, saying that through reading of the scriptures, he came to trust in the Savior. And, uh, but it took him 14 years, 14 years of seeking, reading the scriptures, and eventually humbling himself to put his trust wholly in the Lord Jesus Christ. And another man, a friend of his, now a pastor, who likewise was a Roman Catholic, but simply was converted through picking up a tract that somebody had left little leaflet in the laundrette uh, and he was converted there and then through the word of God speaking to him of his need to be born again uh, and he turned to the Lord with all his heart uh, and was saved but it is a wonderful wonderful word thy testimonies are wonderful therefore doth my soul keep them may he help us to receive his word as it is the word of God and to believe it, to put our trust in the Savior and to know that life that comes from him. May he help us all. Amen. Our last hymn is number 545, 545, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness.
pray, have mercy upon us. Bless us, Lord, that we might hold fast to your word. And now may the grace of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. 